Okay, chapter three, the gear train. This is an important chapter. It gives you an understanding of how an automatic transmission creates the various ranges. First, second, third, fourth. Now we're all the way up to a 10 speed. And it's, uh, it's easier than you may think. We'll go into how the calculations are done and, uh, and, and give you some insight as to how this all works. Now there are three components to a planetary gear, gear set. And we're only gonna use one planetary in our example. Understand that when you get into multi-speed units, they'll couple several planetaries together and connect different components to one another to achieve those ranges. But when you break it down, e think of each planetary of this gear set as its own entity. And then you can do the calculations uh, as you see fit. So the three components, the sun gear. Uh, in our example, it has 18 teeth. We're gonna do a little math later on. Uh, it could be any number of teeth. There could be 30, there could be uh, 14, what have, you, what have you. But in our example, there are 18. Uh, the ring gear in this example has 54 teeth and then the planetary carrier. Now, we just have a circle here that denotes the carrier and it's connected to the three, or the four rather, excuse me, planets of this system. And notice I put in there idler gears. And when we get into the math, it's very important to understand the role of an idler gear. And, uh, and then when you get into that math, understand too that the ratio is calculated by the output divided by the input. If you were to think of a differential, for example, with a ring and pinion, it would be the ring gear, which is the output, divided by the pinion, which is the input. All ratios are calculated in that fashion. Okay, so let's use this wild, uh, wildly exaggerated gear set. Just a bunch of simple gears, and uh, we can go from the output here, which is 18 teeth, through a series of idler gears. This one doesn't do anything, it's just, uh, and all the way over here to the input. So in this example, this might be the pinion of a differential or input shaft to a a uh, very oddly built transmission. And this is the output shaft uh, or the output. So there we have that component and the input and voila, all of these idler gears. Now, I've, I've placed the ratio between each gear and you'll see, for example, between these two is 1.8 to one, between these two is 0.71 to one and so on. All right, and you may be inclined to think that the math requires that you calculate the ratios of each of these and then combine them to get the total ratio. That's not true. The ratio is determined by the final output, which is 18, by the input. None of the idler gears count. They are irrelevant. Input divided by the output. And in this example, it's 18 divided by 10. So for this entire setup that we have, which is rather exaggerated, it's 1.8 to one. And this is a key point because it'd be easy to, to uh, treat a planetary as though the teeth of the planet matter. They do not, they are idler gears. So let's get back into it. Okay, reduction. There's a couple of ways you can get reduction. You can hold the sun gear, uh, input to the ring gear, and the planet is the output. Now green denotes the output, and I'll use these colors uh, for all the examples. So you hold the sun gear, you turn the ring gear, and the planet is connected to the output shaft. This would be uh, an example of, oh, say a, um, a simple Simpson gear train. Second gear would be uh, uh, in this fashion. And if we were to do the math, this is the key and the tricky part, 
in all cases, you're going to add the ring gear and add the sun gear tooth count. So in our example, you have 18 teeth for the sun gear, 54 teeth for the ring gear, and you're going to do something with that, depending on if it's a reduction or an overdrive. In this case, 54 teeth for the ring gear is going to be the input. Therefore, 72 divided by 54 equals 1.33 to 1. That is how you calculate it. You're always going to take the sum of the sun gear and the ring gear and use that as one of the figures in the formula. Now, the other way we can do this is we hold the ring gear and input to the sun gear. And again, if, we, if you're going into reduction, the planet will always be the output. So on the 4L60, this is second gear. The ring gear is held stationary. The sun gear is turned and the planet becomes uh, the output. And in this example, we're still counting 18 teeth and 54 teeth, but instead of 54 as the input, 18 is the input. So our calculation changes. It's 72 divided by 18, and we arrive at 4 to 1 as the ratio. So again, on this 4060, if it had that tooth count, it would be at 4 to 1. So you could easily take your 4L60E as an example and calculate first gear. Be very simple using this approach. Overdrive is the reverse of gear reduction. So that is to say that in all cases, overdrive is attained by the planet being the input. Just flip the transmission around backward and instead of the planet being the output in the case of gear reduction, the planet is the input. And so we can uh, use our same two examples. Example one, we're gonna hold the sun gear. We're gonna turn the planet and the ring gear will be the output. So here we have, notice the calculation that we had initially for the Simpson gear train. It was 72 divided by 54. In this case, it's 54 divided by 72. And notice we're still using the sum of the sun gear and the ring gear in the equation. And we have a 0.75 to one overdrive ratio. That is how every transmission achieves overdrive using the planet as an input. Now we can reverse that just like we did in the reduction example. Use the input uh, for the planet, hold the ring gear, and the sun gear is the output. And the calculation we would uh, go with is 18 divided by 72. 18 divided by 72, the sun gear is the input, the combination of sun gear and ring gear is the output. Get out your calculator and there it is, the overdrive ratio. Very, very simple. And when you combine several of these planetaries together, you may wind up having a situation where you're overdriving another planet that is in reduction mode. So it's the combination of these planets that allow us to achieve nowadays up to 10 different gears. Okay, reverse. Reverse is accomplished by holding the planet. Anytime you hold the planet stationary, you're gonna wind up with reverse. So in this example, we've got the ring gear as the, uh, as the input, and the output, output going to the rear wheels is the sun gear. And now in this example, notice the difference in the calculation. You no longer add the ring gear and the sun gear as some factor in the math because the planet is out of the picture. It's strictly now an idler, period, in the simple sense of an idler. What it does is irrelevant. So it's simply one divided by the other. In this case, it is, it is our sun gear divided by the ring gear and that ratio is 0.33 to one. Now you're not gonna see that because it's an overdrive ratio, so that's out of the question, but you could do that. And it would be 
uh, it would be um, feasible to have this in a series of planets and use it in that method because it would be um, it would be convenient to use that planetary in another series of ratios uh, moving forward. So you could you could find that a much more common example for reverse is going to be uh, turning the sun gear, holding the planet, and the ring gear is the output. So in this case, we have 54 divided by 18, 3 to 1. That would be a, a perfect example. You would see this in a Simpson gear train, like an old C4 or 350 or, uh, or C6, something way back when. Even later models like the 5R55E, um, 4R100 use this method of achieving reverse. And now one last thing, and this is important. Anytime that you have two components of a gear train turning in the same direction, the third will always follow. And we'll have an example of this later on when we get into the hydraulics uh, in chapter four, but you could have as an example, the ring gear as the input, lock the planet with the ring gear, and the output as the sun gear, all three are gonna turn in the same direction and the same speed. Doesn't matter which one it is. It could be the planet and the sun gear, and the ring gear must follow. It could be the ring gear and the sun gear, and the planet must follow. The rule is any two components turning in the same direction and the same speed the third must follow. And we'll, uh, again, we'll see how that works in the next chapter. Okay, now if you want to uh, examine some ratios and not go through the pain of the math, something that you can, you can do is go to the Gears Magazine website, which is gearsmagazine.com, and look over here in the upper right, it says resources. When you go to that section, there's Actually, there's a, a series of them here over to in this page of which you can look at. There's a lot of good information there. And what we're gonna look at is gear ratios. You click on that and you see the page to the right. And in this example, all you gotta do is put the number or the tooth count in these fields and it will calculate the various speeds. Now, we didn't get into the Ravino gear train, which would be an example of a planet that has two sun gears and compound uh, idlers. And, and I specifically didn't want to get into this, uh, into that at this stage because getting this under your belt where it's a ring gear, a sun gear, and a planet is vital. And as soon as you get accustomed to that, looking into the Ravino uh, will be very, very simple. But you can use this to uh, go through your calculations and it's a, it's a fun thing to spend your time with. Now, the last thing I wanted to discuss having to do with gear ratios is the dual clutch transmission. And if, if you break it down, it really is a standard transmission with two clutches. In this particular example, there's clutch number one and clutch number two. This transmission operates with hydraulic clutches. Uh, Ford has a model that are that are uh, dry clutches, just like on a on a regular standard transmission. That's two throw-up bearings operating two different uh, clutch discs. But by and large, you'll see it in what looks like a torque converter, and inside that are two clutch packs, and the transmission has two input shafts, one attached to each clutch. And let's go through this briefly on how this works. It's very slick, and it's become very, very popular. They're inexpensive to build uh, and they operate very, very well. There's a lot of advantages to this system. Okay, so here's uh, an example from Audi. It's a six speed and as you can see, there are two clutches over, over on the left-hand side and notice now they, they color these green and red, so pay attention to those to those shades. The green shaft 
which is over here uh, and attached to clutch number two, um, operates second, fourth, and sixth. And then you have first, third, and fifth that flow through the red shaft. And that is, uh, that is attached to clutch number one. All right, so there you see it. Now, let's just take this for a moment. And considering that we're sitting at a stop, in first gear. So as you see here, first gear is active. Second gear is pre-selected. And what that means, uh, pre-selected, is that it is ready to go. It is engaged. If you look at the hub, if you're familiar with standard transmission, this hub is attached to second gear. This hub is attached to first gear. These other hubs, they are sliders, whichever you prefer, are in a neutral state. They are not attached. They haven't slid over the synchro and attached to the gear. So these two are ready to go. <clears throat> and so green is attached to clutch number two. And so here we do, we're gonna, here, here we go. We're gonna take off, clutch number one engages. We're in first gear and we take off. Now, second gear is already pre-selected. So all that has to happen is clutch one, turn off, and clutch two, engage. And it can do it like that. And you see this in race cars, it's very, very popular. Now you're in second gear. What's gonna happen now in anticipation to a shift to third is this collar is gonna disengage, the computer will disengage it, and it's gonna slide over to third gear and lock up with third gear in anticipation of the shift. And when that occurs, it applies clutch number one and releases clutch number two and you're in third gear. Now the tricky part of this is anticipating what the driver's doing. And you can see some fumbling with the computer because it may uh, now go from second gear over to fourth in anticipation, but oops, the driver just nailed the gas uh, wanting to uh, go um, uh, and pass someone and the computer is gonna have to go from uh, third gear back to second gear, right? So if it's already anticipated fourth, it's gonna to have to shift back to second gear before it changes the clutch. Okay, so you will see that some, some uh, quirkiness sometimes. I understand that's normal. It doesn't know what the driver is gonna do. And there's some fuzzy logic that's, that's included with this when you're turning corners or you're de-accelerating and the, clutch, or the computer, excuse me, will have an idea of what the driver is wanting to do and it will set up the next gear as it sees appropriate, but it doesn't always get it right. So that's our dual clutch transmission. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this chapter. It's on to chapter four. Thank you.